All right? Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 85, 6. I'll just give a couple of revival highlights uh, from down there. Uh, I wanted to do something different at that church. I wish every church would do it. Some of you have been to Emmanuel Baptist Church in Winchester's Royal Soul Winning Outreach, where every morning, afternoon, and evening, people of that church take off work for one day, some of them for a whole week, some of them are retired, and they match up with our soul winning team from the college, some evangelists like Byron Fox, one year Josh Lancaster was there, I've been there the last two years, it's an honor and it's a privilege to go there, and uh, we go soul winning. I want to match that up with a revival service. So I, Brother Bailey's church had been up here, attendance-wise, and, and gradually grew down. The devil's trying to destroy it. It bottomed out here, and it was starting to inch up. And uh, I thought, man, it just needs like a shot of adrenaline, a booster shot, so to speak, uh, to really take off. And they have had me for revival either six or seven years in a row. So I suggested, <clears throat> let's have something like Royal Soul Winning Outreach. I explained it to him. Uh, Brother Rebert, if you're watching, or one of Brother Rebert's members, tell him that uh, another church did Royal Soul Winning Outreach, and a lot of people were saved because of it, and you started it all with Brother Byron Fox. Now, uh, we just did it in the morning, because we're going to have the services in the evening. <laughs> I also took, made sure that the ones coming down were parts of singing groups, so that we could have special music to go with the church's good special music. And the church's choir, our group singing in the choir, really helped their choir out. Uh, they have a good choir, but you had people that can read music, train voices, some of you. That was a real blessing to them. And a brother and sister England were there. And I've already told you about some of the people being saved. There were people saved uh, during our outreach every morning. There were people saved. Uh, at the flea market, there were people saved in the services. Eight or nine adults prayed to receive Christ as their Savior in the services. A Catholic man and wife, who Pastor Bailey's been witnessing to, uh, they came and they prayed. They raised their hand, said they prayed to be saved in the service. They went forward, knelt, prayed together. Bless his heart, though, when he got done praying, he crossed himself. But hey, he's raised a Catholic. He's going to have to grow in the Lord. Brother Bailey and his people are going to have to disciple him, you see. Uh, they had a man on the first Sunday morning who was sitting back in the back row on the far right-hand side. And uh, this man did not raise his hand that he knew he was saved. The pastor, oh, so I told him how to be saved from the pulpit. And I said, if you just pray to receive Christ your Savior, raise your hand. He sat Behind the pole so he couldn't see me and I couldn't see him the whole service. But I saw this hand sticking around the pole. So I took the pastor and I motioned to him and I went like this. Like, look around the pole. Make your eyeballs look around the pole. See that guy. And the pastor called one of his soul winners up. And he, he whispered to him. What he told him was, uh, the man back there, and they knew his name. I forget it. Uh, he just prayed to be saved. I'm not sure that he knew what he was doing. Because they had been praying for him for several years. And he started coming every Sunday. And uh, anyways, the soul winner, Brother Dave Wilson, took him out, led him to Christ. He came back. This man's bawling, squalling. And uh, uh, the pastor said, what would you do? He said, I just had Jesus in my heart. I'll be back tonight. Ran out the door. <laughs> Grown man. <laughs> and he was back this Sunday morning uh, in the service. And uh, he sat back on the back row again. But he moved away from the pole. So that I can see him. Uh, but uh, God answers prayer. When you have revival, the pastor listed off about 12 or 15 things in our Saturday night prayer meeting that happen when you have a revival that don't ordinarily happen. And uh, when he got done, he said, anybody else have anything that happened? People raised their hand. And then his householder raised her hand and said, everything that's been said is a praise. And God says he inhabits the praises of his heritage, his people. And the brother Bailey said, that's right, sister. Those are all praises. So we took time to praise God before you ladies who were down there the week before, before we had our prayer meeting. That was part of it. Uh, but just so much happens. Uh, a, a man said that after I preached a certain message, uh, he said, man, 
He said, that's me. That's me. Uh, he said, my, my, uh, my, my life, I haven't been in the word of God like I should. I preached a message. Are you growing? He got out of that. My message was titled, Are You Still a Baby Christian? That's not what the title of my message was. But that's what the Holy Spirit said to him. And he said, Pastor, he said, I'm going I'm to take time to be in the Word of God every, every, every day. Now, folks, that's what revival is all about. This is one of their best members who has been there ever since I started going there in 2004. And he hadn't been in the Word of God like he should. It took a revival to nudge him, bump him, boom. Doesn't Brother Bailey preach that? He sure does. But God said that he not only gave us pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the word of ministry, but it says evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Then also, uh, one, one uh, lady raised her hand and said, uh, Brother Miller preached that message on prayer. Now, I did not preach a message on prayer. Of course, I mentioned prayer briefly in a couple messages. But see, that's what the Holy Spirit spoke to her about. So that was the whole message on prayer. Did you ever had that happen to you, students? Uh, I, the preacher just barely mentioned something. You think that's what the whole message was about. And she said, uh, I homeschool and I do this and I do that. And she said, I haven't been taking time to pray. She said, I'm not a morning person. And she said, I'm going to start getting up early in the mornings and praying. So that's revival for God's people and then people getting saved. And I am excited about it. And I want to thank Brother Bailey who does not watch Facebook, but couple of his members are on here right now. I want you to uh, maybe thank him. Say, how would I do it? I don't know how to do it. Uh, but I'm doing it right now. But I want, I want you folks to figure out a way to thank him. And uh, for going to the trouble, he's housing us. They're feeding us. I said, I don't want you to feed us. We'll fix our own meals. They fed us anyway. He put money on your school bill students. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he gave love offerings to the England. I said, you don't have to do that. The college is paying. Uh, he paid their salary for one <coughs> week. And uh, gave me a love offering. And I'm so thankful that they went to the extra effort. It's an extra effort to have her life. Did the devil fight? Oh, yeah. Yeah, before we ever got there, uh, he and his wife got what I call an emotional cannonball in the gut. Just... It, it, Visualize an old-fashioned cannonball going in one side and out the other, and there's a big hole there. Uh, but they kept on for God, and God blessed. Uh, if you're going to do something for God, expect the devil to fight, whether it's on your bus route, it's in your church, wherever it is. Now, I want to deal with one part of a message that I already, some of you have already heard me preach. Uh, I preached a message called uh, Revival from Psalm 85.6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I have five points. You can write these down, but I'm just going to focus on a couple of them. The power of revival, it's God. All of our gimmicks and promotions will not bring about revival. Might get a crowd, but it won't bring about revival. So, wilt thou not revive us again? Uh, the people of revival. Revival is not for the lost people, it's for God's people. Will thou not revive us again? When David got revived and got right with God over his sin, in Psalm 51 he said, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Right. See? Hey, backslid, cold-hearted, lukewarm Christians are not concerned about the loss. They'll get concerned about basketball. I like basketball. I'm coaching the boys team this year. I like basketball. Uh, I, I was so proud of our Christian School girls uh, went in the, bat the volleyball tournament a few years ago. They were the munchkins. They were all short. Everybody beat up on us. Now we got to beat up. Oh, I mean we got to compete against uh, them and win the tournament. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, but, uh, and, and I like the fact that Ohio State University, a few minutes ago, Pete Cratterpella was on here. And uh, Brother Jones, you wouldn't believe it. At the end of the first quarter, he sends me a text Saturday. Of course, he's in Pennsylvania. He was a Penn State fan. Uh, Brother Miller, just letting you know, Ohio State's getting beat. I didn't answer him in the first quarter. I didn't answer him in the second quarter, but now I care about that game. Being from Ohio. <laughs> I didn't answer him in the third quarter. 
And in the fourth quarter, when Ohio State took the lead with a minute and something to go, I didn't answer him. <laughs> when the game was over, I responded to him after Ohio State won. And I simply said, thanks for the update. <laughs> of course, the update was when his team was ahead. And uh, he texts back, I hate to report, and I'm sorry to have to report that Ohio State beat Penn State. Now, I, I had fun with that, and the game began to matter when that young man who needed to learn about when the rooster should crow and when it stood, should, that young man uh, gave me a reason to root a little harder for Ohio State. But to be honest with you, I don't really care if Ohio State makes the Final Four BCS Championship Playoff Series or not. Because that's not going to mean anybody's going to go from hell's destination to heaven's destination, you see. Um, backslidden Christian or worldly minded, that's worldliness. I thought worldliness was smoking cigarettes. No, it's being in love with this world. Worldly minded Christians don't care about people going to hell. So they need revive. So they care, you see. Will they not revive us? Revival's for God's people. I want you to notice the product of revival. Here's where it really gets precious. Will God not revive us again that attendance will go up? No. That the offerings will go up? No. Will God not revive us again that thy people, thy people may rejoice in thee? The purpose, the product of revival is so that Bruce Miller, one of God's people, has a right relationship with God. A lot of Christians don't have a right relationship with God. And it takes new spiritual life breathed into them. Revival to bring them in a right relationship with God. And the reason I said that's precious, God wants to have fellowship with you. So wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people, us, may rejoice in thee, God, the product of revival. I want you to notice the period of revival. Wilt thou not revive us again? And this is what I want to concentrate on for a few minutes. The period of revival. I, I preach this message a number of times through the years, but I changed the emphasis of it, emphasis of it when I was preaching at Bellwood Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And that night, happened to be there, he wasn't preaching somewhere else, was Dr. Shelton Smith and his wife Betty. And here he is, the editor of what they call a revival and soul winning newspaper. And he's sitting in the church that night. <laughs> and uh, uh, I preach, we can have revival now. There are people who teach, and I've mentioned this several times, but I'm, I'm going to deal with it right now. There are preachers who teach, and there are Christian colleges and seminaries who teach that the day of revivals is over. It's past. That can't happen now. It's not even supposed to happen now. And they like to point out that the word revive isn't even in the New Testament. It's an Old Testament term. And it's for God's people, the Jews. They're right. The word revival is not in the New Testament. But let me ask you this. If I have a can of pork and beans, and there's no label on the can, and I open it up and I go, what is this? Oh, I know. That's pork and beans. And I put pork and beans on the label. There was a label on there. It said, field vegetable product with animal scraps. <laughs> and that's what the can company put on the label. And I look at it and I said, field vegetable products, that could be corn, rice, that could be anything. Watermelons. Is this watermelon in here? What is this? And I see it's beans. All right, I got to start. What's this chunk? Is this muskrat? What is this? Oh, this is pork. Pork and beans. So I put pork and beans on there. Just because no company puts out a can of beans with pork and call it pork and beans anymore, does that mean that's not pork and beans? You see what I'm getting at? It's still pork and beans. So I'm going to show you in the New Testament some <coughs> revival even though the word revival is not there, it is revival if revival is breathing spiritual life, reviving, making something that's dead or acting dead like it's alive. I'm going to show you where it is in the New Testament and where it was commanded by Jesus. Now, I said in chapel a couple weeks ago, there are preachers who have said 
I'm not going to schedule revival anymore because it doesn't last. Newsflash, preacher bonehead. I don't think all preachers are boneheads. No revival has ever lasted. And yet the Holy Spirit had David pray for revival again. Again. Why don't revivals last? Because the world looks good. The devil is wily. He knows how to tempt us. And our flesh is weak. And so we get revived. I'm going to start praying every day. That lady said. God help her to do it. But let's say she gets tired. And one week she says, I'm so tired. I'm going to do my prayer time to night time. And then she forgets four nights in a row. She needs revival in her prayer time after just four days. Let's say that man is spending time in the word of God. But he has to go to work early for a couple days. He said, I'm going to move my Bible reading to lunchtime. But he has to work through lunchtime. And he goes three or four days without reading his Bible like he should. He needs revival in his Bible reading then. I'm going to say this. Things happen. And we make the wrong choices sometimes. That's right. Things happen. And that's why we need revival. Plus we as Christians sin. We do? Yeah. As a Christian you can sin and you do sin. In fact, 1 John 1 8 says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Your roommate knows you sin. <laughs> the only one you're deceiving is yourself if you say you have no sin. Someday your husband and wife will know you sin. The only one who doesn't believe you're a sinner is you, you fool. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, what do we do then if we sin? Well, we don't have to get saved over again. The next verse says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then the next verse, wait a minute, there's no verse 10 in 1 John chapter 1. But chapter 2 verse 1 tells us about our advocate who represents us before God so we don't have to get saved again. See? So, Christian sin, and we need revival so we repent of our sin and get right with God. Now, I want to show you uh, that the Bible says, will thou not revive us again? A preacher who does not schedule revival in revival time either is unlearned on this topic or he's naive about his people thinking they can go a year, two, three years without a concerted yeah. revival, prayer effort, preaching time, so forth. Or some priorities are wrong. Yeah. They're taking time for like uh, the teenagers down where I was on Saturday went to King's Dominion in Virginia. But they still had revival Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the next day, Sunday, you see. <clears throat> they didn't take away. They said, well, we're going to take the teens down to King's Dominion. They're going to be tired. So let's not have a revival on Sunday, Brother Miller. Just make Friday your last service. Uh, the kids are going to have to get up at 5 o'clock and leave at 7 a.m. So on Saturday. So uh, let's not have revival on Friday night. Let's cut it off on Thursday. Hey, by the way, a lot of preachers now will only give a pastor two or three days for revival. At the end of the first, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we only had 12 people saved. But 33 got saved. 21 got saved on the 4th. 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th day. I'm for one week revivals. Amen, Brother Miller. Amen. 21 people wouldn't have got saved if we would have cut it off after half a week so I could go hold a second revival that week. Now, um, it says, will thou not revive us again? I'm going to a church soon to have a revival where they had not had a revival for several years. And the pastor called me and said, Brother Miller, I need you for a revival. And I said, well, who are the evangelists you've been having? He said, I haven't had any for five years. I said, Pastor, I'm not being mean. But that's why your attendance has gone down. Your offerings have gone down. And nobody's going to soul any with you and your wife anymore. They need to revive. Why did you go five years without a revival? He said, I thought my preaching would be good enough for him. I preach the Bible just like you do. Yeah, that's true. But God gave us evangelists. Pastors and teachers for the purpose. That'd be like saying, we're going to do away with pastors. Why? Because we have evangelists. No. God in his wisdom said you need both. Hey, 
Think teen. Think your youth group. When they have teen camp, it's for one day, right? No, it's for a whole week. What's the idea of that? So that God's working in their hearts on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They're separated from the world and their cell phones on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And most decisions are made at a teen camp on Thursday and Friday. Most of them. After they've had morning, sometimes afternoon, but every night preaching. That's the same thing. Revival is teen camp for adults, you see. Even though they go to work, they set aside five nights in a row, six, seven nights in a row. Well, preachers say today, our people are so busy. Revival's another thing to go to. You get up, preacher, and you preach. Why they need to move basketball. I'm a basketball coach. Volleyball and all the other activities aside for one week and say, God, do what you want to do with me five nights in a row. Revival! And so we will rejoice in him. We'll get in the right relationship with him, you see. That's right. And so, uh, the period of revival is when we need it. Wilt thou not revive us again? But I said, and I preached on that night, that we can have revival now. In closing, I want you to turn to Revelation 3. You know in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus is writing letters to the pastors of several literal churches of that day. And there was a church at Laodicea. And the church at Laodicea uh, wasn't involved in drug trafficking that we know, or uh, human trafficking that we know, or uh, nothing like that. The Bible says their sin was simply, in verse 16, that they, they were lukewarm. They weren't on fire for God, like you are right after you get saved or after you get revived. They weren't cold. They weren't opposing God and his program. They were lukewarm. And here's what God thinks of the lukewarm Christian. A kind pastor will say this. Christian, stand up. Let's say you're a lukewarm Christian. Some days you read your Bible, some days you don't. Some days you pray, some days you don't. Some weeks you tithe, some weeks you don't. Some weeks you go so many, some weeks you don't. You come to church and you don't change. On the way out, I'm the pastor and I say this. Good to have you here today, Christian. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you. Now the preacher is kind to him. But if that was Jesus standing at the door for some people, he'd say, Hurry up! Hurry up! He said to the lukewarm people who he died for in total dedication and love and fervency. And they cannot be dedicated and love him and fervent. He said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. A preacher went to be with Jesus last week. He was a great, great, great soul winner, Dr. Jim Vineyard in Oklahoma City, went to Bill's Baptist Church. He preached a message one time in Covington, Indiana. You are nothing but a chunk of puke. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty rash. But he said, if you're a lukewarm Christian, God will spew thee out of his mouth. And he said, what do we spew out of our mouth? Vomit, puke. So if he's spewing you out of his mouth, you're a chunk of puke. Can you, would you put that on your marquee out front? This week's pastor's sermon. You are a chunk of puke. Hope to see you here. <laughs> that's going to limit your crowd. But that's what he preached in Brother Bob Hamlin's church. When Bob Hamlin was pastor of a church in Covington, Indiana. You're a chunk of puke. Well, that's what God said here. Now notice what he said. He did not say, like some seminaries and Bible colleges are saying today. We're in the Laodicean age. This was the church where? Laodicea. At Laodicea. So this is a time of lukewarmness, a period of lukewarmness. We can't have revival. They teach that in some Bible colleges today. He told them to have revival. He just didn't use that word. He broke it down. Look what he says in verse 16. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing... And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They said, look, look at our homes. Look at our church uh, balance. We got money in the bank. We don't need anything. He said, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind and you're naked. He was talking about them spiritually. He said, I counsel thee, you, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. 
Remember some of the things we do? Our gold, silver, precious stone, and other things, your wood, hand, stubble. He said, dedicate your lives to eternal things, that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, what's that? Purity of life. That thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes that. He said, you're blinded by the things of this world. You need to anoint your eyes with eyes that. How do we do that? We say, God, help me to see things like you do. And then we get into his word so he can renew our minds. The word of God's our eye stab, I believe. That thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, so there's no hope for you. It's the Laodicean age. No. He told the Laodicean age at the church, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And when lukewarm Christians repent, that's revival. Even if the label on the can doesn't say pork and beans. Say, Brother Miller, I just tuned in to Facebook Live Chapel. What are you talking about pork and beans? you got to go back in the middle of, the, of this time to see what I'm talking about. But when lukewarm Christians repent and come to Jesus, that is revival. And then he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and look at the result of us be in a right relationship with God. We'll sup with him and he with me. Fellowship. Fellowship with God. You see. So, I say, based on the word of God, we can have revival now. Especially if we're in the Laodicean church age. If you're going to break this down dispensationally, hyper-dispensationally, I, I might say. What's God's formula for revival? Well, he gives it to the Ephesian church. He gives it to the Laodicean church. There's several. Several formulas here for revival. But in the Old Testament. Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament age. The Bible says all scriptures. Given by inspiration of God. And is profitable. Unto us. For what? Doctrine. That scripture. Was not referring to the New Testament at that time. All they had was the Old Testament, right? The New Testament was in the writing at that very time. So the New Testament, the Old Testament's profitable for what we believe, our doctrine. What should we believe about revival? Second Chronicles 7, 14, God said, If my people. Brother Miller, that was the Jews. Well, who are God's people today? Christians. The book of Romans says when you trust Christ your Savior, you get grafted in. To the tree. Amen? Amen. John 1 12 says, When you receive Jesus and believe on him, you become a son of God. If my people, in this dispensation, it's born again believers, which call themselves by my name. What do we call ourselves? <coughs> Christians. That sounds like his name, doesn't it? Christ. Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin, and then will I heal their land. That formula for revival is for Old Testament and New. Right. Old Testament and New. We can't have revival now. If you're in a church where the preacher says doctrinally, we can't have revival now, start praying for God to lead you to a church that believes in hope for backsliders. Because hope for backsliders is that they get revived. Because God's going to chase them. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous and for and repent. We can have revival now. A pastor asked me to come preach a revival in his church in Fort Scott, Kansas. And about a month before, he called me and said, Brother Miller, I can't have you. And I said, why not, brother? I love this guy. I said, why not? He said, we had a church split. Only half the people were here who were here when I invited. Our offerings are way down. I don't think I can give you a love offering. Uh, I don't even know how many people are going to show up. There might only be 15 or 20 people show up. Uh, I can't have revival. We're not ready for it. You know what I told him? I said, Pastor, I'm not being a smart aleck. This is the very time that you need revival. You just told me your church is dying. And revive means to resuscitate, bring back to life. I said, you need revival. I said, you may not need me. You may need another evangelist. But you need revival. 
I said, you told me you didn't know if the time was right. I said, this is the time for revival in your church. You say, and he invited you to come anyway, and you had revival. No, we didn't. He didn't, and we didn't. And the end was tragic there. But some of you guys can attest to this, and all of you students from last year know, because you prayed. Brother Bill Chapman called me up from Old Cotton, New York, and said, Brother Miller, I'm in a church. The building's here. It's beautiful. The owner parsonage, it's nice. They've got 18 people. They're going to close down. 250-seat auditorium. They're going to close down. Why? They're discouraged. They're dead. They're discouraged. They're dead. They're going to sell it all. Give the money to missions. I said, are there other good churches in town? He said, not unless you believe in praying to Mary. Not unless you believe everybody's going to heaven. You don't have to be born again. He, I said, what do, you, what do you call me for? He said, we need a revival. Will you come up here and preach a revival? He believed now was time for revival. Because that church was on life support. Some of you guys went with me. Knocked on doors every morning or afternoon. Sometimes both. And uh, we never had 18 people there. We had double that. And God blessed and their church got revived and instead of selling it their people got revived instead of selling the property you were there too you were one of the guys you were the pianist the man. instead of selling the church they said all right brother chapman if you and brother miller can help us find a pastor we'll keep going and that pastor brother peter evander is seeing people saved on a regular basis and he he had a correspondence with me i think it was a text or something and he said, and, and the blessing of it is some of my people are wanting to get in on this soul winning thing too with me. Can we have revival now? If we can't, don't tell the church in Olcott because they got revived and people are getting saved. Amen. So don't tell them that what happened can't happen now. <laughs> we can have revival now. Amen. This was preaching, but this was teaching. I gave you books, chapters, and verses. Don't let the devil change it on you from some other swanky tongue, effective communicator who tells you something contrary to the word of God. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. We don't have to listen to who yells the loudest, who uh, has the most colored lights, who has the most fake smoke machines on our platform to determine if we can have revival now. We can go to your word and see if we can. I thank you that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that when we backslide, it's not all over for us. It's not the sin unto death, but you rebuke and you chasten and you try to get us to repent. Turn back to you so you can revive us. You're knocking on the door of lukewarm church's hearts, wanting to bring life back into the church and into its members. God, Sanctify our students, indoctrinate us in the Word of God about this matter. And Lord, if any preachers are watching or listening, they're usually on our Facebook Live. Don't let the devil talk them into giving up on revival in their church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That is the end of chapel. Turn.